to our panel. I'm Alta Price. Yes, Alta like Alta. <laughs> um, and we're and Margaret Carson and my co-moderator. We're really thrilled to have you all here today. And we very much want to make this an open conversation between our expert panelists and you guys, translators, editors, what's happening in our field. Um, this is the second in what we hope will become an ongoing widespread series of events on this topic of where women are in translation. So Margaret and I co-moderated another, a similar panel um, in May this year for the Penn World Voices Festival and just had great turnout and it was the, you know, um, a, a lot of reactions and I, you know, I was talking to someone last night who said she does the same panel every year at Alton and I thought, oh no, I'm, we're doing the same panel, but it's not at all the same because we have completely different panelists and a lot has happened since May. Um, we've had a publisher, you know, devote an entire upcoming year of their publication schedule to publishing women in translation and various other um, aspects of the discourse. So, um, yeah, it's just very exciting. Uh, so I'll, we'll start by introducing our panelists and then we'll have a brief, um, each of them talk about where they're coming from, their experience, and then sort of get at this topic from all different facets. So um, immediately to my, uh, to my right is Kaya Stromanis. Kaya is an editor at Open Letter Books. And you also translate from Lithuanian? From Latvian. Latvian, yes. sorry. <laughs> I'm leaving. <laughs> Please don't. Um, and then we have Maytal Radnitsky. Radzinski, sorry. No. <laughs> who came all the way from Israel to join us on this panel. Um, and is, I won't, I won't put, give you the entire credit, but you've been a major player um, with your blog at Bibli.io of bringing attention to this matter. Um, and also founded Women in Translation Month, which is happening every August this year, I believe was the second year, yep. correct? Um, Jim Hicks from the Massachusetts Review. Uh, anything else you want to say? <laughs> <laughs> you also translate. Yeah, yeah, translated. So you're an editor, translator. Um, Susan? And, mm -hmm. and often have difficulty telling the difference. <laughs> difficulty oh. telling the difference, yeah. excellent. Well, yeah. more about that. Ask more about that, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, Susan Harris from Words Without Borders, um, editor, uh, not a translator. No. <laughs> a publishing veteran. Publishing veteran, yeah. yeah. So, um, in terms of, I think we'd like, we, and we have some, we brought some images, um, and I'd love to sort of, I think, Margaret, did you, have yeah. anything to add, or should we dive right in? I think we should dive right in, and um, uh, we thought that, um, well, during the course of this panel, we're going to develop a kind of a history of this issue and how it's been presented um, uh, before, and particularly with Susan. Um, but we want to start with um, Nital, and because you're um, really before both Alta and I got involved, um, you were working with the three percent database and. Um, Probably all of you are, are aware of the 3% database. It's um, put together by Open Letter, Chat Post, and everyone probably at, at Open Letter contributes to that in some way, to keeping that enormous list, like a, a complete <laughs> inventory of um, titles and translation of fiction and poetry. So that's not the entire spectrum of titles and translation, but it's a fairly big chunk, and it's very um, representative and, and very relevant uh, to us. Um, so um, before we started working with the numbers, Maitel, you were there, and you were, you were um, calculating uh, graphs, working with the data, um, showing trends. So I thought, you know, we would start with you and we would, you know, you could take us through the charts a little bit. But I do want to say, um, um, and, and Maitel has a, a blog that, uh, what's it called again? Uh, Biblibio. Yeah. Biblibio. Biblibio. So everyone, you can Google that. <laughs> Um, and I've been reviewing her postings, and I, and I thought this was an interesting, um, something that you wrote, I think, is very representative of where you're coming from, where we're coming from. When I started posting about the lack of women writers in translation, I had one idea in mind, get people thinking. I wanted to spread awareness, make the issue, issue known, and get readers, reviewers, translators, and publishers involved in a discussion. Okay, so that's precisely what we're doing today. 
Um, so, Nato, would you like to start telling us about how you got involved in, um, in, in this? You, sure. How you kicked off this discussion? Um, honestly, it, it comes from being a reader. I'm not in the publishing world or uh, a translator of kind of the literary translator type. Um, but when you're a reader and you start, you know, looking at your own, it was it was literally just a Saturday afternoon where I was like, huh. I think I haven't read very many books by women writers in translation this year. And that evening I went through the numbers and I saw, oh interesting, I've read only 25%. That seems, that seems very imbalanced. And I wondered if it was my fault in the books that I was picking or if it was something in the books that I was being presented with. And so I decided I would look at the 3% database, which I thought was a pretty representative account of sort of contemporary um, publishing. And I saw that that same kind of 25 to 30% number was reappearing. And then it kept reappearing. Um, and I looked at 2012, 2013, since then 2014 and 15. And the numbers just were very, very consistent and not balanced. And so. Uh, my mathy side got the better of me, <laughs> and charts emerged, and um, I think that this is something that, that, as a world interested in literature and interested in literature Ooh. and translation, yes. it's, we need a yeah. No, I think that numbers speak Ooh. very loudly. Yeah, and uh, anecdotes go so far, yeah. but you know, when so, you see it, it's it's kind of bleak. So. <laughs> So um, would you like to um, take us through some of the um, uh, statistics, <laughs> uh, your, some of your charts? Uh, sure. I actually don't remember which, which year this is. I think this is 2014. Is that, I don't remember. But uh, the statistics are basically the same. Um, you see a kind of consistent 28% uh, translation rate for women. I made this list by Googling just the names of every person in the database to make sure that I was getting accurate representations and in case someone was using a pen name or whatever. Um, so that's why there's that 4% unknown because some writers I just couldn't find any information. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just shockingly male dominated um, in a field that sort of doesn't have that great of an excuse, I guess. Um, I've, I've been told in the sciences, given lots of excuses for why uh, women might not be able to advance or stay in their works, and one of the things that I've realized is none of those excuses apply to literature, because there's really nothing that would stop it, except for the question of what's happening in other languages, but there it's kind of hard to measure the numbers. Yeah, right. It's very difficult so. to really um, analyze this because you have to go back a number of steps. Yeah, And also I want to say that we really, do, maybe, correct me if I'm wrong, but we don't have figures of what's being published in the United States, what's being written and published in English. Do we know what the gender breakdown is in fiction and poetry? I don't think, I think anyone is Vita, measuring that. I think right. Vita does. But they do that for magazines and journals. They They're not doing it for books. I and think for books that the general, I feel like I saw somewhere that it's something like 55% women writers for fiction. Like there is a majority. Uh, I might be completely yeah, making this I, I up. Would, so I, would like to know, I would like to know that source. And I, I, wouldn't, they, they I would not take my word for this, but I, I vaguely remember seeing something that it is actually majority women in publishing fiction. Definitely, they've done many studies to show that it's a majority of women reading fiction. Totally. Yeah. Um, and then Vita kind of shows that despite being well represented in the technical publishing side, those numbers don't carry across to reviews and they don't carry across to sort of the more critical representation. And I think that we also see that in literature and translation, except it's so much harder to judge because there's such a smaller group of women to even begin to look at, are they being well represented in reviews or? Yeah, and there are like that. seven or eight different countries. Actually, yeah, that it's are, it's seven and three percent database. And and yet some of the major com countries you see that that's where the, the problem is is pretty consistent. So is there a, um, we do have, think there's yeah. So I everyone I just I you know I grabbed these charts from BiblioBio, um, and. Yeah, these are the. They are, this is by publishers. publisher. 
right? Yeah, this is the publisher. Yeah, um, so you can see that most publishers are, uh, these are the top, I think, uh, I just took the, the ones who had published more than eight translations uh, that year. I, I don't fully remember, I'm sorry. But um, you can see that it's mostly men, yeah, which is you, the red. Yeah, red. Uh, <laughs> so yes, you have a couple of publishers who are devoted to women, like the Feminist Press or a couple of other publishers who were all women, but it was two or three books. And then you have the most prominent publisher of literature and translation with no women. <laughs> so uh, that it's will... It's stalking, yeah. Yeah, that, that I guess that's pretty small uh, yes. in the back. <laughs> but, um, and then also in language, it's... Uh, you have, you have a few kind of, in, this is by percentage, so it looks a little more positive than it actually is. But if you look at the major the languages, sizes, like yeah. French uh, that's under 30%, and French is the most translated language, I believe, kind of consistently, um, it's still really weirdly low. And I'm pretty sure that French is actually it looks higher than it is because Quebec, oddly enough, publishes a lot of women writers, mm -hmm. but France doesn't. So that's a weird little statistical tidbit that is not mentioned here. Um, no, we have that with, um, also with Spanish. For some languages, yeah. there are many countries and many different um, The, the country breakdown centers. also is, is yeah. pretty, pretty interesting and not entirely fixed, so. Uh, do you have a chart by country? Um, I'm this not is sure. Language. Okay. This is language. I think this was the other year. I think the others, yeah, those okay. are yours yeah. and Margaret. Okay, so all right. So we don't have yeah. them by country. Yeah, we have, um, on, uh, we have a Tumblr. Did you mention the Tumblr? I, did, I haven't yet mentioned the Tumblr. Yeah, so okay. um, tumblr.womenintranslation.whatever it is. But yeah, if you go Tumblr Women in Translation, that will take all of these graphics, um, with the exception of Maytals. Our Maytals will be there later this afternoon. I'll get them up. Um, but that is our general, any time we're coming across new information, um, linking <coughs> articles as, as more sources are talking about that. So we're maintaining that. Um, yeah, if you go back to May on the Tumblr, then that shows a full array of... Um, by country. By country that, that we did, charts <laughs> that we generated. And we're just going to keep hoping it'll be very different next year and <laughs> after that. Um, it's yeah. a process. Yeah, yeah it's a process. Um, so. I, I have a quick, Meta, how old are you? Because you're, you're <laughs> 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 because this is really important, actually, um, I'm, uh, that you're not. I'm almost 24. So. Okay, so you're, you're a very young activist who's taking up this cause, and I think that's really crucial. 21-year-old me who started it uh, would be certainly, su certainly surprised. Uh, okay. But yeah, it's, uh, it's a cause. It's important. <laughs> and could you talk about um, the Women in Translation Month that you started? Yeah, sure. And, and um, so August uh, is Women in Translation Month. If you want to know why it's in August, it's because that's when I have the least amount of tests and school study. Uh, <laughs> so, but uh, the idea actually was not mine. Uh, it was a blogger uh, who just kind of sent a, a Twitter private message and said, you know, hey, did you, uh, do you think that maybe you should take this sort of, you've been posting a lot about this, do you want to maybe host kind of a, a month looking at it? And then I was like, oh, that's an interesting idea. So. Um, the idea was originally to raise awareness and to encourage people to read books by women writers in translation. Um, it's kind of morphing into aggressively pushing the cause <laughs> and uh, hoping that people not only are exposed to more women writers in translation, but recognize that there is this big problem and kind of trying to together figure out what we can do. So this year was the second year. And uh, in a few months, preparations for the third <laughs> will begin, and hopefully in a few years it will not be necessary because we'll be at a fantastic uh, uh, equilibrium. I am an optimist. <laughs> um, and when you say you aggressively pursued it, could you um, be more specific or what, about your activism? And <laughs> your, yeah. um, I, it's... A lot of people respond, I think, in general to, to causes that look at 
minorities or representation of women or marginalized groups and you're kind of labeled a radical and then that's discouraging because it's the perception that you're doing something wrong um, and so it's difficult I think to explain to people what the project is especially since most people aren't aware of the problem and so that's why there's the focus on just like know the problems mm -hmm. see the graphs see the statistics and uh, I guess in that sense it gets aggressive. <laughs> okay, and you're on social media. You, 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 you tweet. Yes. Is that, is that where it gets a little heated? Uh, it's, it, it can get heated. Usually it's actually been in blog comments where uh, I, I had one particularly nasty one in the first year of Whit Month where uh, I was called a lot of contradictory names and uh, just roll with it. Yeah, I mean, well, this is part of the, um, you know, Feminist we, activism we really gets a lot of um, comments, anonymous comments, and blogs. And, and yeah. Okay, so hang in there. <laughs> we aim to keep the discourse, discourse positive, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and I think, I mean, it's interesting thinking about even just how we're talking about it um, and looking at some of the graphs, like are we going to talk about men versus women? Um, or, yeah, it's, yeah, it's uh, talking about parity versus balance versus equilibrium. And people are really sensitive to language, which as a translator myself, I find it really interesting how people react. And sometimes if you just tweak the way you talk about it a little bit, they're more open or not. Um, so, um, but our aim here is definitely to, to look at the positive steps that we can take. Um, and with that, I would like to ask you, Susan, um, we actually had a look at Words Without Borders data in terms of gender. Just a couple of months. A couple actually, months. Really. It's, it's pretty daunting months. to look at. And so far, everything seems very balanced. Oh, we I'm were, glad you We were. <laughs> <laughs> and I love that you, you had a no clean clue bill. <laughs> that you were so representative of what's actually out there in the world. So, given what everyone's saying about how women publish less frequently than men worldwide, uh, how do you guys do it? What's your um, What's your editorial process? I do also want to mention, um, I think Worlds Without Borders had the first article on this by Alison Anderson yes. several years ago. So yes. tell us a little bit about where that came from um, and how, how you guys pull it off. Well, the article, uh, Alison's article came about uh, because she was at London Book Fair and was in conversation with our founding editor, Samantha Schnee, who has unfortunately uh, defected to London and is now then now part of the UK publishing uh, pu publishing mafia over there or translation mafia excuse me uh, keep our mob straight uh, <laughs> but Allison was talking to to Sam about the discrepancies that she'd noticed uh, and again like Maytal having a sense of something having a having a suspicion and then actually running the numbers and you know, discovering that it was, if anything, worse than she realized. And Sam encouraged her to write a blog post for us, mm -hmm. uh, which she did. And what was, what I think was instructive was that Allison mentioned that there, there were at that time, and I, I, I tend to get the statistic incorrect because it's both translators and writers, but the international, uh, the Independent Foreign Fiction Prize which recognizes both writers and their translators, um, had at that point not had a female winner. Is that right, Danny? Yeah, there was one, one okay, was, I think, you. in retrospect, it was, it was like 2001 or something. Yes. There, was, there was a weird... Yes, there had been one. And Allison actually went to the panel on, on the prize at London and said she rather timidly raised her hand in the Q&A and said, um, there's no gender parity here. And actually, Elif Shafak, who was one of the j jurors, spoke very eloquently to that issue and said that it certainly was being, that it was something that they had noticed that they were aware of. Um, and I think it, it's the awareness. I know that uh, we, we, did have, we did have one funny, when I was relieved that we, our genders were balanced, we did have one um, inadvertently amusing issue of, closer to the beginning of, of Words Without Borders where uh, we had a guest editor who sent us a batch of stories, and they were Turkish. And for me, anyway, Turkish names are completely ungender identifiable. Well, it turned out we had an issue of all women, which was delightful. <laughs> but we had uh, we had no idea. And interestingly, of course, uh, since we did not know that, we had no in we had no indication from the contents of the writing, or any indication that they would be more interesting 
or not. Um, I think in, in terms of how we do it, um, as you all know, we work with people who are on the ground in the field. I mean, we obviously, we work with publishers, we work with agents, we work with the people who are putting writers into print and who are controlling their rights, but we're also working with people who are researching languages and literature at the source and are perhaps living in those countries or are tapped in. Certainly now, um, people have much more access to uh, di digital resources and pub um, international publications. They can read more widely in their, in their source languages. And I talk to people and find out what, are, what is being published in your countries. I mean, it's quite a diff there's quite a difference between what we found for, for example, our October issue, which is Estonia, which is a very established publishing industry, um, has a very, very active and very supportive um, uh, literary, uh, literary grant program in the government, um, funding, both funding both translation and publication. Um, you have the difference of that, and then we have Cambodia, which is our November issue, and you know, of course, you don't, you know, you're not going to go to the like the what the Cambodian version of the New York Times and look look who's being reviewed. I don't think so. So, it's a question of knowing how to identify the sources and how to, again, how to how to work your networks, which sounds terribly, uh, I realize, just sounds really ter terribly cynical and as if I should you know, like be talking about branding any minute now. But um, <laughs> but it's a question of knowing who's working in the field and also being being available and being. Um, being visible to those people. Great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. But we have a ton of follow up questions to that. Oh, I, <laughs> what were you going to say? But no, go ahead. Well, so I'm, I, it's just it's exciting, and I didn't even know about the all female Turkish issue. Um, so, very much inadvertent, maybe, in a way. But the people that you are, your guest editors or yes. whoever is is sending things and yes. are, are aware of this issue. Absolutely. When we talk with people, when we engage our guest editors, obviously we rely a great deal on consulting editors. To date, we've published work from 128 countries and 106 languages. Obviously, we don't have that expertise among our two, you know, two full-time uh, editorial person staff. But when we talk with our, series edit with our uh, guest editors, we say, we're looking for any number of things in this issue. Obviously, literary quality is paramount, but we want balance. And if you're not bringing me balance, then you need to bring me a good argument about why. And generally, you know, sometimes we don't hit 50-50, or, well, my preferred one would be 80 female <laughs> and 20. Um, but we don't, some, we don't, sometimes we don't hit 50-50, and it's more challenging, but we are always working to get at least some, you know, close to balance, mm -hmm. at least some, re some representation. Okay. So you're not leaving that to chance, basically? Not at all. Do, it doesn't happen? No, it doesn't happen, and I think that it was something that we were not necessarily as aware of as we could have been in the early days, just because there were so many other, uh, other considerations. But certainly, uh, now that we're, um, when we're doing our planning, when we're looking at who we're publishing, when we're looking at balancing not only genders, but countries, languages, um, people of color, which is a you know, related but uh, similar conversation, um, there are just a lot of things to keep in mind to keep that balance and to make us a, a worthwhile publication. Excellent. So on, in a similar vein, um, Jim, I, you guys had a marvelous, we looked at it a few months. Um, in terms yeah. Um, of, and well, you guys I aren't, it's true that you aren't exclusively <coughs> work in translation, but. Yeah, so um, Jim, if you could talk about um, the Massachusetts Review and, and basically your history with it, because I know that it was an existing journal when you took over as editor. Um, and you have, obviously, your editorial vision is now, it, yeah. it's changed, and you are not only, well, what, why don't you describe it? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, let me start just by saying that this is, you know, the, the, I think you really have to work on brand consistency here. I think wit you used once, I think it, it works very well. 
and uh, and it it could be. Uh, but anyway, the Wit Project or the Wit Caucus, which I think we've now established, and we'll get the names, <laughs> yeah, um, is 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 absolutely perfect for us. Um, for um, I've done it. In, I've been an editor now for six years, which might seem like a long time, but since I had basically no qualifications whatsoever before starting, I I really feel like I ought to be out there taking notes. But it, but having done it that long, you know, it's time to take stock. Um, the uh, the magazine, yeah, it's it's been around since 1959, and particularly in the first 15 years or so, um, it was a real political force in, 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 you know, if a small magazine ever can be. I mean, we were really one of the few places where you could publish black arts writing, um, um, black power. Um, we had a, an essay by Stokely Carmichael, that was his name at the time, which was called something like, uh, Whitey, black, uh, black man's going to get you a mama, or something <laughs> like that, which, uh, which the editors changed to um, something like, towards black liberation or something <laughs> like that. But anyway, um, the, um, and we've also, two years ago now, um, we were lucky enough to hire a managing editor, Emily Wojcik, who for over a decade was, was working, one of the people helping to run um, Paris Press, which is a really small uh, feminist press that publishes only women. So one of the things that Emily's really um, been a driving force behind is to do just this sort of work, to do counts, right? And uh, and so we're, we decided, well, let's look at the, at that time it was five years that, that you know, the, the Hicks regime, I guess, um, and and then five years before that, just to really figure out what we've been doing. Yeah? Um, the, uh, the other thing I would say, just for kind of the history side of, of, of what we have done, I mean, one of the things that was fantastic, I was going through the desk and I found some notes uh, that had been there forever, um, and, and I found one note in particular from um, our poetry editor for 25 years, a woman named Anne Holly, who was a, a wonderful poet and a translator, and I found this note where she said, um, and it was just kind of scribbled in there, I don't want to be part of any magazine that doesn't have at least one woman as a senior editor. And, and, uh, and I think she won that fight, but you can understand as well, just from the fact that she had to fight, you know, what things were like then, right? Um, in in uh, in 1972, I think, or, or 1970, um, one of our founding editors retired and re and and named two women to replace him, and they published a, an issue called Women and Issue, um, and it was um, you know literally the first two things in this an, an essay by Bella Abzug, the next one by Anais Nin. Um, it had work by Angela Davis, Lucille Clifton, I, I wrote this down, I don't remember it all, Tina Midotti, um, Maxime wow. Kuhlman, Audre Lorde, and, and uh, you know, so... so what, what year was that? 1972. Yeah. But the reason I'm bringing it up now is not to brag. I mean, this kind of could sound that way, but I actually want to point out the fact that when it, we had the 40th anniversary, and I had just you know, been editing a couple of years then, um, we had a long discussion about whether we were going to celebrate it with some sort of so, you know, women today an issue or something like that. Um, and I, I was kind of talked out of it, mm. which I still think, mm. why? What? And, you know, some of the comments, uh, one, one in particular, and I think it was hopefully mildly humorous, was, you know, gender, it's not really a relevant category. Mm. Um, mm. But, but I think more of the discussion at that time was sort of with everything that's going on, do we really want to focus on women as a sort of known category? And, you know, obviously the, the, the tremendous progress that's been made in multiplying and, and, and complicating our understanding of gender is, is tremendous. But if it means, you know, it's an end around to doing something that, you know, the word I use is parody. And uh, so anyway, um, and oh, I'd also say that we just had a symposium for another 40th anniversary. We published Chinua Achebe's Image of Africa essay, 
which you know was one of the things that helped launch postcolonial studies. Um, and we just had a, a symposium. Um, it was absolutely wonderful. Um, in fact, one of the things that was wonderful about it was they invited um, five or six African writers. And the majority of the panelists at this symposium were women. Um, and th that's going to be a special issue. But I'm also offering it in contrast to the special issue we didn't do, right? The other anniversary. So, um, so that was then. Um, now, the magazine, I, you know, as I said, we're trying to, to uh, count um, every which way we can. Um, but just for this, let me say, in in the my six years, um, although I probably didn't count correctly, I must be close. Seven hundred and seventy-eight contributors. Uh, 400 of those were men, um, 378 were women. So that's basically what, 51.5% male, 48.5% uh, women, which, you know, it probably reverses the actual population differential, but, uh, but you know, it's not awful. Um, so then I started doing what we came here to talk about. Translation. I mean, people who've, who've heard me at Alta before have heard me talk about when I came in, I said, I want the political energy we started with back, and I want to do it by publishing more in translation. Those were the, the two things I said at the time. And, and I think we've done pretty well. Um, I probably, last time I talked about this, I think I've overestimated now that I've counted better. I think we're up to about 15.5% over this six years um, in translation which is different. I mean, again, you know, nobody has done more for translation than Susan, but I also think that taking a magazine like ours and saying this is what we want to do um, also, you know, contributes to a different kind of change. Sure. So in a typical issue, you would have uh, maybe 25 different pieces, essays, poems, mm -hmm. fiction. And, and I'm counting the artists, too. Cause we, and art, cause, right. yeah. That's another feature yeah. of the magazine. Yeah. And, uh, and then that portion, that percentage would be translation. And yeah. And I, I, when I was looking at the magazine, I didn't say, oh, I'm just going to look at the translation. I looked at the entire mm -hmm. table of contents to see who was mm -hmm. being represented, and mm -hmm. I found it absolutely, yeah. I found parody. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, but that's what, again, I want to get to when I started doing the numbers for translation. Here's what it came down to, right? Um, the um, you would think that we would have parity, right? Mm -hmm. um, over the same period, male authors in translation were favored over female authors in translation, sixty-seven percent to thirty-three okay, percent. And that sounds. I mean, we're actually kind of at better. at the high end of appalling. Um, yeah. From, from it's, it's yeah. better than average. Yeah, and yeah, if if you look at if you look at the the, the numbers that that, that 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 Wit has compiled, we're at the high end of appalling. Um, yeah, and it, it it is. It's twice as many guys as women, okay. right? And uh, and then male translators versus female translators. It's not as bad. But, but there's still bias, and it's still apparent. It's 54% men, 46% women. Yeah, that's, that's what we think. Yeah. yeah, wow, interesting. Yeah. And, and yeah. what I think is also interesting is you didn't expect to find that. No. And I, I've, I've read pieces where editors say that they thought they had almost parity, and they actually went back and counted, and it was mm. not. It was more like, yeah. Yeah, yeah so, happened. you know, one of the things that, that, that I'm just trying to emphasize here is that, you know, awareness isn't enough, but, you know, attending to counting, you know, make, making, you know, seeing what's really happening, you do get surprises, and at that point you can start to do something about it, and we will. So I should stop there, I guess. Yeah. Can I add one thing about the translators? By all means. Uh, one of the first things that people were sort of responding, and this included publishers, uh, when I began to, to put out the numbers and my observations was that, well, you know, there are actually a majority women translators, um, so obviously it's not that there's any sort of misogyny at work. And I think that the, the observations uh, that are at the Tumblr, the Women in Translation Tumblr, where there is the breakdown and you see that it's actually less than 50%, is very interesting because the narrative that every single person said up until that point was that women are translating more and so obviously the problem 
is not anywhere in the system. It's in the original countries or languages or whatever. But then the numbers just do not support that. And it's a great example of how uh, when women are close to a majority, or uh, close to, to 50%, close to parity, it seems like a majority. So uh, okay. that's, that's, that's a well-known yeah. thing, yeah. and it's yeah. here again. So. One, one other thing I'd emphasize, too, is that you know, basically one of the, the, the main point I want to make is that we set out to publish more in translation. We did publish more in translation, and we replicated this bias, yeah. right? Yeah. And so, so we're, not, we're doing something wrong. Right? When we get an issue and we realize there's a big bias, we do, like Susan said, we look to fix it by you know, sorting through the slush and saying, we need more women, let's find something we want to publish. Um, you know, there's no reason you can't do that with translation. But also, one of the things that makes publishing more in translation hard when you really want to, like as I, I, I've told you, we do, um, is that we don't have a ton of things to sort through. So, so it's not just our problem, it's also okay. yeah. Alta's problem, yeah. well, we're, right? We're why, is it, yeah, why is it we get, you know? Yeah. We're, we're gonna get back yeah. to that, that yeah. issue. Anyway. Yeah, we're gonna talk about whether you guys solicit, whether you give your, your um, people who submit your feed, feedback, if you're open to pitches, but before we get too far ahead of ourselves, Kaya, I would love to hear from you, and I've noticed you've been taking notes this whole time, so hopefully you'll have a lot to say, not just about what's going on at Open Letter, but um, uh, I think it was Chad who posted, Chad Post who posted something about, you know, their growing awareness there about this issue. Um, but yeah, I wanted to ask you about your editorial experience there, especially um, if you if you want would like to talk about your knowledge of the editorial scene in, or publishing scene in Latvia versus the U.S. To getting back to this idea of oh, it's not our fault; it's the source, the the, the countries who are originating these these um, authors who are unbalanced, and we can't help but replicate the unbalances. Um, you can just give us a little overview. Um. I'm trying to figure out where to start. So I will say really briefly that with the exception of a couple of interns helping out, the translation database is like 99.9% .9 Chad. He sits there and he is the one who looks through the books, looks through the copyright pages, does the research online. So I can take exactly zero credit for any of that. Um, so he is the sole person behind the translation database. Um, and I do not know how he manages that, but he does. Um, so at Open Letter, we publish 10 books a year. One of those books generally is poetry. There's a different editor who takes care of that. Just, that's just to point out the differences between Words Without Borders and Mass Review. Um, and generally, what, what we do when you talk about factors or, or elements to consider when preparing a season or a year of books, we do look at gender. We try to get as close to a 50-50 as we can. Um, sometimes it doesn't all line up in one season and we'll end up having just that's the way that we've set the contracts and the manuscripts and the translators um, schedules. That's how it ends up where we'll have like most of the women in the first half of the year, most of the men in the second half. Um, sometimes it's more scattered. Um, but we also take into consideration origin, country, language, um, things like that. So I mean, for example, um, Chad is our publisher. His hobby horse is Spanish language literature. That's what he did in high school. That's what he read in college. Um, so we end up sort of backloading a lot of our editorial schedule with Spanish language literature because, again, that's his hobby horse. That's what he's always liked. Um, we could theoretically publish 10 books from Spanish language authors in one year, but we try not to do that because there are so many other languages in the world. Um, and I don't want to say that gender is not something that we do not consider, but I feel like from my editorial perspective, the number one thing that I look at is whether or not I like the book, does it fit in with our aesthetic and our backlist. And I, I really don't want to be the person that says that all other categories, including language, gender, origin, country, are secondary, but my main concern as an editor is do I like it, does it fit in, and is it something that I want to stand behind 100% as an editor that works at a publishing house. And then when it comes to the gender things, that's where we, you know, that's something that we do keep in mind and do consider. And that's one thing that I feel like I may be on on a sort of a versus side of the of the spectrum here. But um, 
everyone's been sort of tossing around the, the terminology of awareness or, or excuses or reasons and things like that. And I personally do believe that um, the origin countries should not be discounted for what they're publishing. Um, and to use Latvia as an example, I think that historically male authors are more prominent in Latvia. However, the female authors are the ones who get the more press and the more recognition publicly. Um, and I don't know that much deeper than that, but I think I'm just thinking back on my childhood where, and of course it is, it is a society where however, you know, 100 years ago, 50 years ago, that's what it was, where, where men were the better ones and all that. But currently in 2015 and in the last 10 years, I think female authors have had more publicity and they've been more publicly acknowledged. Um, and I don't mean that in an anti-massage way, just like when you look on the news, the reviews are of books written by women and things like that. And I guess where I would go as an editor, if I'm sitting at my desk and I have a manuscript A and a manuscript B, and I think manuscript A is kind of middling and manuscript B is fantastic, and I would cut people to publish it, and it just happens to be by a male author, and the other one is the one that's middling happens to be by a female author, I'm gonna take the one that I would cut someone over because that's the book that speaks to me as a book. And I guess to, I feel like I'm gonna walk into all sorts of mires here and, and swamplands, but as a reader and as an editor, mm. I tend to find myself blind to gender as a first step, where that doesn't, it doesn't influence my decisions as an editor. And again, we are aware of the gender, and we do want to 50-50 that as much as possible, as, as Susan and, and, and Jim have been saying, but it's not, it's not the first thing that I consider as a reader and as an editor. Um, and we also only have 10 books a year, so we try to I don't know. I can just digress and yeah. completely Could you, keep digressing. I have a question. Could you talk about how a project, a potential book, lands mm -hmm. on your desk? Uh, what are the, uh, how, far, how far back can you go? Can mm -hmm. you trace? You're coming, uh, this is the problem. We're coming from so <laughs> many different countries. Yeah. And there is, uh, say, gatekeepers. There are many different points in that path mm -hmm. where there is going to be a gatekeeper. And it's not always going to be the same. Every book may have its own path. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering if, um, um, what agents, cultural organizations, um, are, what, what, what is it that brings a book to your attention as a potential book that will be published? Do you mean what as in content or what as in who? Well, like like just the, mechanically, the, how, does it, how does it get to you? Because are, are you soliciting manuscripts? We do, we do everything. We do our own in-house research. We are constantly in contact with agents. Um, we haven't made it to, physically made it to book fairs of late, but um, you have to consider the book fairs that we go to, the agents and publishers we meet with. Um, we get emails and booklets from agents and publishers with their, with their backlists. Um, we get manuscripts from translators, people we've worked with before, people who have worked with people who we've worked with before. Um, you know, obviously coming to Alta and talking to people about what they're working on. Um, sometimes it's, you know, we read a book in translation and we enjoyed it and we sort of wonder, you know, keep an eye on what is happening with that author's career and translation in the future. Is that something where if, for example, if FSG decides to not continue with, is that something that we can jump on and, and continue with it ourselves? Um, so really, it's all over the place. I mean, we don't have one specific source. It's, it's all over the place. And sometimes it's even authors who say, oh, this, you know, this friend of mine or someone who's like up and coming um, in whichever respective language I as an author speak, um, you know, I would be happy if you'd read it, read it and give me your feedback yeah. and things like that. So, um, yeah, no, no one specific thing, but it's, it's from all over. Yeah, sure. I mean, I'm just kind of wondering, you know, precisely what you just said about the author who recommends another author. If that happens to be a male author, then the recommended author might very likely be another male author. It's sort of like a, um, an old boys network. I'm just saying in general, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, there are like these sort of invisible ways that yeah. uh, this pattern is perpetuated. Yeah, and I'm not saying it doesn't happen. I'm not saying, like, I like that Jimmy used the word awareness, and I believe that, I guess, my, my, my stance is that there's a difference between gender shaming publishers and translation and encouraging them to be aware and to make that something that they consider actively in their backlist. Because I remember when, when you sort of joked about it right when we sat down, it took me a minute to remember, but right when this started being a sort of a Twitter thing, I remember looking at it and momentarily feeling, feeling a little bit defensive and yeah. thinking, well, I'm, I'm reading and I'm 
considering what is offered to me, and that's not to say that I'm pure and innocent in this and that I couldn't go and look for more women authors in these respective countries, but I feel like there's a lot more than just saying, you know, pointing to, um, for example, to open letter and saying you're not trying hard enough. And it's like, well, if I go to, if I go to Malta and they have 10 authors and nine of those are men, let's just say as hypothetically, Malta has only 10 authors and nine of them are men and one of them is a woman. If from my perspective, the woman's book is not something I want to publish, I'm not going to go there. And then is that my fault that I, that I as a publisher and with my backlist and consideration don't publish her book because I found one of the other nine authors books to be more up my alley? It's possible that I find all 10 of them to be crap and then Malta yeah. just doesn't get published by Open Letter. Right. But I mean, I feel like there, are, I'm not saying that that's not something that's being considered, but I feel like it would be maybe more fair to shift the weight to speak about equality a little bit more evenly and yeah, say sure, that sure. maybe there are agents who should be pushing their, their women authors a little more or, um, you know, there are other presses that are doing a year of women authors. For example, we are doing a five book series of Danish women authors, which initially started out as just we wanted to do five Danish books. We went to Copenhagen, met with publishers, agents, authors, booksellers, tastemakers. And as we were coming back from the trip, we had already figured out three authors we wanted to publish those happened to be three women and at that point we went freaking why not let's just do the last two as women as well because that seemed to be a pattern at that time that the Danish authors that we were reading about the ones we found a little more interesting for our press happened to be women and so we I mean maybe that's cheating <laughs> because we just sort of made it into a women's series um, but you know there, there are ways around it as a publisher and there are ways to make that a thing but I guess from my perspective if um, if, I, if I think something is middling and there's something that's better than that, I'm going to go for the thing that's better than that, regardless of man, woman, child, bear that wrote it. Yeah. Yeah. No, sure. I, I, it, I, I, don't <laughs> and I would love to publish a bear book, so if anyone knows <laughs> okay. a bear, a bear that has written a book. Well, we, we, get yeah, we, we actually have an iguana issue. Oh, <laughs> good. All right. I'm on board. <laughs> okay, yeah, we're definitely... Um, we're, 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 mm. It, it's very hard to find uh, the right kind of activism that mm -hmm. doesn't rub some of the place in the wrong way. Um, but uh, surely, um, um, I, and this happened with Vita too, um, but mm -hmm. it has had a, a, a reaction mm -hmm. uh, in the publishing industry. And I think um, uh, it, it's good to have responses from publishers. And you happen to be at this <laughs> conference, so that's why we would love to have other publishers respond. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's a future project. Um, so uh, well, thank you. Should we should we turn to our um, looking at um, our next set of questions? And yeah. actually, we we, we 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 kind of started um, a little bit when um, questioning. Uh, you know, how does a book get to you? Mm -hmm. um, what are the mechanisms? And so I want to um, kind of um, pick your brain because you've been in the business for a while, Jim. You know, what is it? Um, how do you perceive? Well, we'll start with you. Um, and, and you actually, in putting together your issues, you seem to have a very um, enlightened approach um, in going um, to people, knowledgeable people in that country or that theme, and, um, and they're coming up and they're putting together an issue that is representing, that is representative. And so could you um, talk about how, you know, how much effort does that entail on your part, and how do you locate those people? And are you, yeah, what are your strategies? Right, it, it, it varies, of course, month by month, but and also by the amount of lead time we have. But certainly, I'm always trying to find people that we have, trying to find authors in countries we haven't published from yet. Um, again, as I said, we have 120. We have 127 countries. I think um, that still leaves something like it, that still leaves 70 odd, depending on how you count. And some of those, obviously, I, I don't think we're going to nail anybody from the Vatican, uh, but <laughs> but there are other countries that um, there must be literature. Maybe some of it's oral. Maybe some of it is just not going to be accessible. But regardless, um, you know, we, we we're never we don't want to be arbitrary, you know, and you don't want to say I want to be complete at the expense of quality. Mm -hmm. And certainly, we've had we also have had situations where. Um, we've had a, a, a batch of work come in and uh, actually rep, um, in this calendar year, I won't be any more specific than that, but we declined um, a poem by a woman contributor just because it, it just was weak and she had nothing else available. 
there was nothing else that could be translated on our timetable. And, you know, although superficially I didn't want, I, I missed, I, I was unhappy about not being able to include a woman writer. Um, realistically, I don't want to give a, an, a forum to someone who, whose work isn't that great. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think, uh, again, it does take, it takes a lot of research. I'm always online, I'm always talking to people, asking people. Um, I, I don't travel as much as I'd like, but anytime you go to, the, uh, go to conferences, um, especially someplace like the London Book Fair where you have lots of different people, um, you, have, you have an opportunity to find out what's going on in fields and languages that you're not necessarily regularly exposed to. I mean, there, you know, our, our Africa coverage, for example, is disgracefully scanty. We have, you know, the colonial languages are just great, but, but, um, but we're still really, really skimpy on the, on the African languages. That's something I'd like to change. Um, it's been it's been a constant um, it's been a constant source of frustration for me that I that's one example where I just haven't been able to make any headway. But it's a, but I'm not going to stop working on it. Sure. Are you, are you um, do you have any idea um, the pieces that are translated from lesser known like or mm -hmm. lesser translated from languages? Um, do you have any idea how many go on to actually being published as a book? Or? We are aware at this point of somewhere around 20 authors who have landed book contracts for work that originally appeared in our pages. And although in some of those cases the direct cause and effect may be somewhat blurry, in many of them we did actively promote them and we did actively and we did definitely assist in their acceptance for publication. We have a, a, a periodic newsletter that we send to editors and publishers both in the US and around the world um, highlighting books that we published extracts from that we think would work well in English translation and those newsletters are very are very brief because we publish a lot of terrific work but not all of it is going to work is is something that we necessarily can promote as being something that a pub that an English language editor is going to want to take on um, a collection of short stories for example most editors are just not going to be particularly receptive to that and we do publish a lot of short stories but so it, it, it's a huge part of our mission in introducing writers who have not had an English language audience before and in expanding that audience and in you know hopefully making that an audience that comes to these writers in print um, actually, Jim maybe we could turn to you and, and, um, and you can talk about um, some of the mechanics of um, soliciting articles, and do you have guest editors, and do you um, yeah. talk about uh, your selection process? Maybe? Yeah, well, I'm yeah, because yeah, you did mention slush pile earlier, mm -hmm. so. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and specifically, I wanted to, to emphasize the fact that, that, you know, when we started with this project of publishing mm. a lot more in translation, mm. the next question was so so how do we get it I mean the first thing I heard from from one of our editors was you know well the problem with translation is we don't get very much and what we get isn't very good and you know it's a bit like the question of parody I mean I somehow just cannot um, bring myself to believe that there's not more great writing outside the English language than there is inside it I mean, because there's more writing, so there must be. And the same thing with parody. I just can't bring myself to believe that there are not, you know, equal numbers at least of of writers from both. Uh, so, so then, Can I so ask you what? A, yeah. Is this a question of um, uh, translators, um, women, uh, uh, translators who are translating women, um, uh, getting the manuscripts to you? Yeah, yeah, and it's as simple as that, but uh, but it's not as it's not as easy for, you know, one of the things that, uh, you know, I was I was really happy when, you know, three I guess 3 years ago now, Liz Harris invited me to to come to Alta to be on a panel and and not only being great fun, um, I thought this is really something we have to do because we have to let people know that that we're doing this. Yes. It's hard to to, you know, it's hard to get the word out. We started a translation prize for the same reason, um, just to make people know we're serious. I mean, I published some of my own translations, so they would see, look, the editor translates. They must actually be serious about this. 
Um, and the other thing um, is uh, is going to book fairs and talking to the small presses that yes. that are doing it. And and you know, we've we've worked with the Open Letter. We've worked with Archipelago. We've worked with you know other press. We've worked with a bunch of different presses um, that are doing fantastic work. And and you know when when it, the questions about quality. You know, you also have to understand that for a small press, the risk is so much higher than it is for us. I mean, if you publish 10 books a year, um, you know, how many books can you afford to be failures, right, before you're not publishing at all anymore? Like zero. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Whereas, you know, at some level, a magazine's ephemera, no? It's, uh, you know, we, d we treat it like it's a book. We talk about it as a book, but it's not a book. Right? You have a chance to just do stuff um, to see if it's going to work in a way that, a, that a, the small press simply can't do. And we're also yeah. on t typically on a shorter timetable. Right. So we can be pro not only proactive but responsive. Yeah. And there's always a danger, certainly from my own days in book publishing, there was a danger of signing something up and then by the time it came out, having it be either superseded or old news or just something that was not hot anymore. Yeah. Not that I ever did anything particularly hot. But, yeah. Um. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so I mean, that's basically mm. the strategies I've used so far. Um, trusting the translators and, uh, yes. and, and the, the good small presses, figuring that they know where the quality work is and that uh, if they know that we really are interested in publishing it, then we st we've started to get much more. Okay. And, and do you think that having uh, a translation published in Massachusetts Review will help um, visibility of uh, both the author being translated and the translator? I mean, it, uh, Do you have any success stories? Or as yeah, Susan uh, no, um, a, a few. I mean, not not as many as, as Susan, I'm sure, because because you know she's focused, you know, squarely on that, and and uh, and has been doing it longer. But but yeah, we've got at, at least a couple of cases where you know when you really, especially working with the small presses, when you get to know. Um, what they're doing and when they get to know what you're doing um, and you see and understand each other then you can say look you know we published this you should really look at it yeah. and uh, and you just have a sense that that uh, you know that this is something that could go there yeah. no I mean I think both of you are, are kind of filters in a way for yeah. uh, for publishers you know, yeah. it comes out in New York magazines and I'm, I'm also certainly very much um, dedicated to the idea of presenting not only unknown authors but emerging translators and a lot of people have, have published their first translations with us and or other early translations with us and I'm always receptive to that because I think that's also part of our mission in, in, the, in the field. Um, people come to us, uh, book publishers come, often come to us, one in particular um, keeps coming back and I keep saying haven't you figured it out yet? But, but, um, but again, people are, you know, publishers come to us for, for references, and we are very happy to be able to provide those. Yeah. No, I, Referrals, I, excuse me. I didn't answer the question about, about special issues and guest editors. And, uh, and the answer is basically when we have a special issue, it's usually guest edited. Um, and that's a real opportunity exactly to do this kind of work because usually what that means is you know we don't tend to we have but not recently done sort of specific regional well regional a little bit but uh, but say a country issue or something like that mm -hmm. um, but we do get people as guest editors who have real expertise and deep knowledge of you know other languages and other cultures and therefore that means they're tapped into something that, that isn't yet in English. Um, the best example I've got, I think, recently is, is uh, about a year ago now, we published a, an issue we called Mediterraneans, and, and the idea was that there are plenty of them, and, uh, and we need to hear more about it. And the main thing we did with, we had two guest editors. One was Michelle Mushevac, who runs Interlink Books, and so we were able to bring into um, that issue over half of, of the uh, the work comes from North Africa and the Middle East mm -hmm. because that's what Interlink does and that they knew you know what was going on and uh, and what we could do okay. there so it was important that you knew yeah them and could make that uh, yep yeah so yeah. 
But am I hearing the message correctly that you guys need to get more work from translators? That's <laughs> why do you think that? Okay, need translators to do more, take more, Okay, you know, I really do like coming to Alta because it's fantastic. <laughs> but this year, I'm actually going to make the magazine pay for it because they should be. You know, in the past. Absolutely. Yeah. You're at work right now, John. Yeah, well, I mean, as I said, getting the word out is really the only way to get past the... Because obviously, as Susan was saying, it, it, the question of quality is true for everybody. Maybe the risk is smaller for us, but we're not going to publish anything we're not excited about. Um, and, uh, and we need to find out about stuff that we don't know about. I mean, that's what I put on, when, on the little blurb on our website about translation. I said, we want to publish the best writers we've never heard of. You know, um, and how how are we going to hear about them? Well, coming here and saying stuff like this. Yeah. Um, okay, so if you get a submission uh, and it doesn't quite fit, would you um, give any feedback to the translator about why it doesn't fit, or just you know, because uh, uh, mm. the question of rejection also has come up in the Vita uh, discourse at uh, women take rejection. Or, or men just come back, you know, yeah. the next they just send something else. And yeah, or they've probably already submitted it 20 places. Anyway. Yeah, and, or, yeah. Or, or men will ask for feedback. Well, we're not, and those of you who read the magazine know that we, don't, we no longer do random pieces. Everything that we do either fits into the theme of the issue or a smaller feature that runs every month. Um, so I am not looking for... We're, we're not looking for random submissions, and I actually tend to get a, a little shirty when I get one because it does mean that someone hasn't really bothered to pay attention to the magazine, which I never point out. That's the kind of feedback I'd like to give. Pay attention. <laughs> but um, but we, cer we certainly are receptive to people coming to us with ideas for features or issues if they have a solid proposal. Um, and that's the kind of thing that, and, but if somebody would come to me and say, I would, you know, for example, uh, somebody wrote and said, I'd, I'd like to do um, m work from X country, and I said, well, you know, we just did that issue two months ago. You, know, you, miss, you either weren't paying attention or you really don't, um, you know, this isn't how we work. You, you do it once, you don't do it every month after that. Um, so we don't, we don't give, we don't, we're not able to give feedback on, in, on that kind of submission. But if somebody came to me with a proposal for an issue or, or a, a feature and had something that I thought was promising but didn't work, I'd certainly, you know, that would certainly be a conversation that I'd have. What about you, Jim? Yeah. <coughs> I've, I've occasionally um, kind of personally given long feedback to, to pieces that I thought were interesting but, but we couldn't publish them. Mm. And, and at least in one case there's a writer that uh, that I, I did that um, a second time and said, you know, um, to, and, and, uh, I don't know how, how explicit I should be about this, but I said, you don't really want to be doing brown face the rest of your life, do you? Um, there's a market for that, but, uh, but you're really talented and you can do more than that. Um, and it's actually somebody who about eight months later sent us something else and we're going to publish it because it's it's fantastic. Um, but but generally the question of feedback is you won't get any from us because because we can't keep up. Yeah, we just can't. And Kaya, we have any kind of. I started out doing that about three. I started with Open Letter three years ago, and I thought it was the nice thing to do because I approached it as you know. Also, I, I translate myself, and so I feel like I have one foot on both sides of that line. But you just. And by you, I mean sort of the royal you slash myself, and sort of what Jim was saying, like one person you can't, with the amount of submissions that we get, you just, it's exhausting, you can't do that. It's emotionally tasking, and with the exception of the ones that are like about dragons or detectives, where it says on our website, and to piggyback off of Susan's, please pay attention to what a website submissions say, open letter does not do genre literature. So if someone sends me something about, which has happened and not infrequently about dragons, I write back and just say in bold, we do not publish genre literature. And that's the, that's the most I'll do. And I've had people email and if anyone in this room has submitted to me and we, weren't, we decided not to take on the project and you asked for feedback and I just didn't answer, it's because I just don't have the time exactly. to yeah. sit yeah. down. And I used to give the feedback in the rejection letters and also sort of 
spitball ideas of other presses that could be approached, but then I've spent, you know, half an hour writing a letter, and yeah. I, just, I just can't afford to do that sure. time-wise, so. Yeah, n n none of us can, none of us are in a situation, as much as we'd like to, none of us are in a situation to be other people's research assistants, and that's often what it comes down to. Yeah. Sorry, that did sound really smart. <laughs> <laughs> What's even worse is sometimes, like, sometimes the cases that <clears throat> my feedback would just be, I didn't like it. And that's... I'm s and I'm sorry, you know, it's, it's literally, it's not you, it's just me. And I think that's one thing I see this frequently. That's what makes literature as an, as an entity interesting, is that you're not going to like the same books I like. You're not going to like the same books I like. And that's fabulous, and it's fascinating, because it keeps things moving and pulsating and interesting. But I'm not going to write that to someone. I'm not going to say feedback, colon, I just didn't like it. <laughs> you know, because I also, when I first started out my... My number one concern was that people would think, oh, it's my translation, I'm terrible at this. And then I found myself justifying frequently and saying the translation is beautiful, I like the way you did the rhythm or the meter or the dialogue, something like that. But at a, at a certain point you have to realize that we're all adults and everyone's going to get rejected at some point. If you haven't, what's your magic potion? Um, but it's going to happen and it's just part of, that's just part of the process. And maybe you were just one tick short of the right press and the next one you're going to send it to is going to be the right one and I also have a fairly firm belief that the books that we do not end up taking on I get really excited when there's a book that I end up rejecting and a few months later or a year later it pops up on my Amazon feed and I'm excited and I've written emails to people and saying congratulations like we didn't we didn't take it but that's fabulous that someone else did because it was a great translation it was interesting it just didn't work for our press yeah. Um, how are we doing this, for time? We have about five minutes. No, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to be that person because we could be here all okay, day. Okay, well, let's take tomorrow. some questions, and we can get. We started late, so let's. let's uh, or uh, comments, reactions. Yes. Well, wouldn't you say Knausgaard is the ultimate woman yeah. writer yeah. with his focus on the quotidian and the detail and the agonizing over the tiniest? That's, I'm saying that sardonically, but <laughs> you know, I, th I think there's a, there's a bit of truth in that. Sorry. No, but it's interesting you bring that up because I think, and I don't think we want to do too much name naming, but Amazon Crossing is one of the most balanced, yeah. I don't, yeah, we don't Last year it. they were the only one to pass May 50%. Tall. You can talk about this. Um, yeah, and so there they are uh, on the right, left hand side. But at a, at a lot of presses, I think, when, when talking about this issue, they say, oh, well, we don't take that kind of, and you know, I don't know if we want to start talking about chiclet, but I think you have some articulate things to say <laughs> about stylistics and aesthetics. The, the term aesthetic, uh, which Kaya raised, I've heard a few times, and I've uh, seen it in very negative connotations. Um, that it's often used as an excuse for why a publishing house might have, uh, Open Letter has generally a really good one, if I recall correctly, it's around 40%, which is above average. Um, but you'll see a lot of times people coming and saying, we have an aesthetic, women don't write according to that aesthetic. And that's also why I find uh, what Susan said earlier about the fact that um, they couldn't tell if something was written by a woman is being really, really important because aesthetic is very, very influenced by what you're perceiving and your kind of previous biases. And so yes. having having this this thing of, well, we believe in a certain, you know, one person's chiclet is another person's complicated, humorous, intelligent assessment of a romantic situation. And interestingly enough, it's called chiclet when it's written by a woman, and, you know, comedy when it's written by a man. So a lot of times these, these kind of genre definitions do have a gender bias, and it 
there is a little bit of sexism in how people market and how they subconsciously market and how they subconsciously perceive it. And I don't want to publish or blame at all here in the sense of, you know, everyone is terrible and sexist or whatever, but we all have unconscious biases, whether it's towards gender, race, or whatever it may be. And I think that that kind of question of the genre or the aesthetic or the style uh, is very tied into the... No, I would just add that, that everything I've learned about the history of the magazine that I, I'm now uh, in charge of is, uh, is exactly this question. I mean, when they started, they said, look, literary magazines are completely dominated by a kind of hegemony of new critical aesthetic you know, T.S. Eliot is God, and, and, and we actually don't think that that's the only good writing that's out there. And so they started publishing women. They started publishing black writers. They started publishing Latino writers. And, um, it's risky. But, but it worked. I mean, it made a magazine that's lasted over 50 years. Um, right, you know, the, the big publishing phenomenon everybody knows in translation this year is Ferrante. Ferrante's writing about female friendship. Gee, maybe there's a market, um, you know. And and the fact that you guys uh, and every this this movement has already convinced a couple of small presses that they're going to 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 go in that direction. Sure. Again, the, you know, they're going to publish maybe ten books a year or less, and they're not doing it because they think it's not going to sell or that it's the political correct decision to make. They're doing it because they think that and they realize that it, this should work. I mean, the publishing industry is a really small world, sometimes parochial in different ways, and aesthetics is part of that. But that also means it's not that hard to change. Mm -hmm. um, it shouldn't be. It's, you know, and shaming, eh, I'm kind of in favor of, actually. For <laughs> shame. <laughs> and any, any other... Um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm in favor of shaming the capitalist side. Uh, because because, because that's, cause it's, it's fundamentally shameless. I mean, and networking, you know, actually, we used to call that organizing. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So. Um, okay, any comments? Gotcha. Alex. Say something. Just I thought uh, it hasn't come up during the discussion, so I wanted to wait. But the, at the panel that um, you had at Pen World Voices, uh, the contribution by Rob Spillman, they talked about the lengths that he went to to ensure that there were more uh, women contributing to Ten House magazine. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, yeah. it kind of came up a little bit here about how you write a rejection letter, how you solicit um, was very important. You know, the language that and the effort that went into the curating of that magazine and um, it seems pretty obvious that when you don't pay attention at all it's always going to result in a, a much more dominant uh, male uh, uh, proportion whether it's a journal or a publishing house but it, it, it has to be a conscious decision not quotas I don't think I've ever heard anybody say there have to be quotas if a publishing house decides to go all women that's great but that if you aren't paying attention whether you're a woman or a man, the default is always going to be one. That was what yeah. I took away from that. Yeah, and he obviously put a lot of work into that effort, and I think that's um, uh, where things get difficult uh, for editorial people. But it has to, it is, it represents a lot of work, and it represents a lot of work among um, women, too, to um, put our interests forward and, and to make these kinds of things happen and to keep it on the agenda. Maytel has been doing. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Oh, another thing that didn't come up, but came up in sort of the pre-discussion, was reviews. Yeah. Um, I had a so I we like, have. Oh, yeah. Okay. We're okay. Just, just quick. We're just gonna stay here. And well, yeah. Well, can I can I, right, make, so, can I make can I make a suggestion? Yes. If you want, do, do, we do we you will we will repost any review that fits the criteria of this panel. Um, you know, if if it, if Chad does one, just send it to us. We'll post it again. You know, okay, yeah, because that's part of it. Getting getting the word out and and changing the discourse is making sure it gets to as many people as you can. 
And you said review, review by women? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're starting to try and do more yeah. book reviews on our blog. Mm. Um, but again, we don't have a lot of time. It's hard to find the people to do it. You know, I, you know, my former fiction editor, he stepped down and he said, but I will keep writing reviews for you guys. And, and why don't you just send me books in translation? So now I can think, Good okay, deal. now I'm only going to send him books by women in translation. Yeah, yeah. Books. Yeah. See how long it takes him to catch on. I mean, um, I, I can say at least part of the idea of, of Whit Month and kind of having this, this structured environment for discussing women writers in translation was very much also to encourage people to write reviews because yes. you really don't see as many reviews of books by women writers, partially because there are fewer. And I think also that kind of the Vita observation um, that it's often perceived as less literary and most of the outlets are very literary and so um, there's definitely also a problem in the reviewing world and of course the fact that translations in general are not quite at the level of uh, reviewed as much as regular literature. And that's a problem. And that, that's a separate yeah. problem but I think that you're all probably really well aware of it and care about it. Um, but definitely there encourage reviewing. I can say that from the reviewing side. Okay. All right. Well, um, thank you all for being thank on our you, panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.